Welcome to lecture 17 of CS285. Today, we're going to have a brief discussion of reinforcement learning theory. And, you know, th this is the only theory lecture in this course, so I won't go into a great deal of depth. My goal is to mainly just give you a sense for the kinds of theoretical analysis that we can do in reinforcement learning algorithms and the kinds of conclusions that we might draw from this sort of analysis. So what questions do we usually ask uh, when we're doing reinforcement learning theory? Well, there are a lot of different questions, but here are a few common ones. Uh, if you have an algorithm, some kind of reinforcement learning algorithm, and it's provided with n samples, and it, use, and it uses those n samples every one of k iterations, how good is the result from this algorithm? Uh, what does how good mean? Well, let's say we're doing q learning. We might ask, how much does the learned q function, q hat k after k iterations, differ from the true optimal q function? Could we, for example, show that q hat k differs from the optimal q function q star in some norm by at most epsilon? Uh, now, typically, these are algorithms have some kind of randomness in them, for example, randomness in how we generate the samples. So we can't really guarantee that we'll always have a difference less than or equal to epsilon. So typically, we would have a guarantee that it's less than or equal to epsilon with at least some probability 1 minus delta, where delta is a small number. Um, so typically, we would want to show that this is true if we have at least some number of samples, where the number of samples depends on some function of epsilon and delta. And typically, we would want some well-behaved function. For example, we might want n to um, increase logarithmically with delta. Another question we could ask, which is a slightly different question, is how does the policy induced by the q function at the kth iteration differ from the optimal policy in terms of its q value? So let me unpack the notation here. So q pi k is the true q function, meaning the true expected total reward induced by the policy pi k, where pi k is the policy corresponding to q hat k. So asking what is the difference between q pi k and q stars really amounts to asking how different is the expected reward of the policy at iteration k from the best expected reward you could get. So this is really a measure of regret. All right, so q pi k is not the same thing as q hat k because you could, for example, have q hat k erroneously overestimate the q values. q pi k is the true q value of the policy uh, corresponding to q hat uh, k which is typically the argmax policy. And there are other questions we could ask too. Uh, another kind of question we could ask is, if I use a particular exploration algorithm, how high is my regret going to be? This is a little bit more uh, elaborate, uh, but typically, uh, you know, we might want to show that, for example, some kind of exploration procedure gives you regret that is uh, logarithmic in T. So the, what I have here is actually the bound, the full uh, version of the bound for an upper confidence bound exploration method. And you can see that it has uh, a linear term multiplied by delta, but delta is a very small number. And then most of the uh, uh, bad stuff comes from this uh, first term, which is um, which goes as the log of t. But there are, of course, many other questions we can ask. So these are just a few examples. We'll mostly focus on um, sample complexity type questions today, uh, so the, these first few. Uh, but keep in mind that there are other questions. Now, when we're doing reinforcement learning analysis, we do typically need to make fairly strong assumptions. So analyzing full deep RL methods in the most general setting is generally not possible. Um, so effective R analysis is very hard without strong assumptions. And the trick is to make assumptions that admit interesting conclusions without uh, divorcing us too much from reality. Uh, so some examples. Um, in exploration, uh, you know, performance of RL methods is greatly complicated by exploration because uh, how well you learn, how many samples you need, very strongly depends on how likely you are to find potentially sparse rewards. Um, since theoretical guarantees typically address worst case performance and uh, worst case exploration is extremely hard, uh, we typically don't want to couple analysis of exploration together with analysis of uh, sample complexity that addresses things like approximation error or sampling error. So in uh, studying exploration, we want to show that some exploration method is good. Uh, and typically good for exploration means that it is uh, 
that will learn a good policy, a policy that deviates from the optimal policy by some epsilon in time that is polynomial, typically in the number of states, the number of actions, and in one over one minus gamma, which is the horizon. But separately from studying exploration, we might also study learning. So if we somehow abstract away exploration, if we somehow pretend that exploration is, uh, you know, works well, how many samples do we need to effectively learn a model or value function that results in good performance? And this is a slightly separate question. Um, so it might actually behoove us to separate exploration from learning because if we always analyze exploration and learning together, oftentimes the difficulty will be dominated by exploration. Uh, but worst case exploration is extremely pessimistic. You know, typical exploration is not nearly as bad as the worst case if, for example, you have a well-shaped reward. So in many cases, we might want to abstract away exploration and somehow basically get rid of it so that we can study the sample complexity of learning. Uh, one way we could do that, for example, is with a generative model assumption. So this assumption just says, you don't actually have to explore. You can just sample any state action you want in the entire MDP, however much you want for basically any state action tuple. This is, of course, unrealistic. This is not what real reinforcement learning algorithms do. But making this kind of assumption can be very convenient because it allows us to study how difficult learning is, essentially if we assume that exploration is easy. Uh, right. So one way to do this is to basically say we're going to have oracle exploration. For every state action tuple, we're going to sample uh, PS prime given SA n times. So we'll just literally just like uniform carpet bomb the whole MDP. And, then let's, and at that point, the problem is still not solved. We still need to study the effect of sampling error. OK, so we've got some questions. We've got some assumptions. But before I really dive into the analysis, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is what is the point of all this? So you know, we could say that maybe the point of all this analysis is to prove that our RL algorithm will work perfectly every time. That's usually not possible with current deep RL methods. When we put in all the bells and whistles, all the tricks of the trade, we don't even end up with algorithms that are guaranteed to converge every time, much less to work perfectly. Another goal is to maybe understand how errors uh, are affected by problem parameters. For example, do larger discounts work better than small ones? Is it easier to solve a problem with a large discount, or is it easier to solve a problem with a small discount? Is it easier to solve a problem with a large state space or a small one? Should we take more iterations or fewer iterations? If we want half the error, do we need two times the, the number of samples? Or do we need four times the number of samples or something else? These are all somewhat qualitative questions at some level. And usually we use precise theory to get imprecise qualitative conclusions about how various factors influence the performance of our algorithms under strong assumptions. And then we try to make the assumptions reasonable enough that these conclusions are likely to apply to real problems, but they're not guaranteed to apply to real problems. So it's very important to understand this. I think there's a kind of a tendency sometimes for people to say, well, my theoretical result proves that my algorithm will work every time, or I have a provable, uh, you know, uh, provably good RL method. That's nonsense. We never have a provably good RL method, and anybody who tells you so uh, is not being forthright. Theory in reinforcement learning, and really in most of machine learning, is actually about getting qualitative and somewhat heuristic conclusions by analyzing greatly simplified special cases. So don't take someone seriously if they say their RL algorithm has provable guarantees. It never does. The assumptions are always unrealistic, and theory is at best a rough guide to what might happen. This is not unique to machine learning. Of course, the same is true in other areas. For example, in physics, you could have some theory that describes the efficiency of the ideal engine. Now, no current physical theory will allow you to analyze the actual fuel efficiency of a gasoline engine in a modern car. It's just too complicated. What it will tell you is some guidance about the limitations and potentials of idealized versions of that system. And that's exactly what we do in reinforcement learning theory. We provide qualitative guidance about the limitations and potentials of idealized versions of the algorithms that we actually use. And what we look at when we come up with a, with a theoretical result is not uh, a guarantee that the method will perfectly have a particular sample complexity. What we look at is how does its behavior change as we change different problem parameters? Does it become more efficient or less efficient as the state space gets larger? Do we need more iterations or fewer iterations as we increase the, uh, the uh, discount factor or the horizon? And these kinds of qualitative questions uh, 
they're actually very important. They can guide our choice of parameters and algorithm design decisions, and we can get some qualitative guidance on those things by doing theoretical analysis. So having understood all that, let's actually get into the, the meat of some of the analysis that we can do. So we'll start with some basic sample complexity analysis. And a lot of what I'll present uh, in this lecture follows the RL theory textbook by Alec uh, Agrawal and others, linked at the bottom of the slide, as well as some uh, lecture slides that were made by Abrel Kumar last year. So we'll start with the Oracle exploration assumption, meaning that for every state action tuple, we can sample the next state s prime n times. And the algorithm that we'll start with is a very basic kind of model-based algorithm. Now, I use the term model-based rather loosely. This is actually you know, a pretty idealized algorithm. So what we're, going, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the transition probabilities, p hat s prime given s a, simply by counting the number of times that we transition into s prime from s a. Okay, a very simple tabular estimation strategy. So there's no function approximation here. There's no neural net. Uh, we're just doing tabular estimation. We're literally counting how many times we land in a particular state s prime. Uh, this, of course, only makes sense if the states are discrete and the actions are discrete, and we can build a table with all these numbers. Um, and then what we're going to do is we'll first focus just on policy evaluation. So given some fixed policy pi, let's just use p hat to estimate the q function q hat pi. So this idealized algorithm takes some policy and then it uses this p hat to exactly estimate q hat pi. Now q hat pi is not the exact q function, but it is the exact q function under p hat, right? Because p hat fully determines an MDP. And then we'll do something like, um, you know, q value iteration to estimate q hat pi. Okay? So step two is exact, but using an inexact model p hat. Okay. This is a very simple algorithm, and our goal is basically going to be to understand the error that is induced by the fact that p hat is not perfect. Now, to uh, kind of uh, take stock of what we're doing here, this is, of course, a rather simplistic RL method. This is not how we would usually do RL. And the main purpose of this analysis is really to understand how sampling error in estimating p hat propagates into q functions. So for a little bit of context with this, you know, in supervised learning theory, there's a, there are a lot of tools that we can use to answer questions like, if I'm trying to estimate a quantity like p hat, and I have some number of samples, how accurate is my estimate going to be? And by introducing step two, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to take these standard supervised learning results, and we're trying to pass them through the RL machinery to say, well, how do bounds on sampling error from supervised learning translate into bounds on sampling error for q functions when that q function is the result of some kind of Bellman backup. So that's really going to be the flavor of the analysis that I'll present. So the questions that we'll ask, how close is q hat pi to q pi, meaning that we're going to estimate the q values of our policy pi, how close is it to the q, true, true q values of that policy? So ideally what we want to show is that over all states and actions, if we take the infinity norm of the difference between q pi and q pi hat, that infinity norm should be bounded by epsilon uh, with some probability one minus delta. Uh, and if the number of samples is larger than some function of epsilon and delta, where hopefully it's a, it's a nice function, a well-behaved function that is not exponential or something crazy like that. Uh, the infinity norm is just the max, right? So if you see me write an infinity norm, what it really means is just the difference uh, between the two things in the argument for the worst case state action tuple. And it's good to use the infinity norm because it gives us a bound on worst case performance. Now we could ask uh, another question. How close is q hat star if we learn it using p hat? So if we don't just evaluate some policy that's given to us, but if we instead try to actually run uh, you know, q value iteration, like to actually find the optimal uh, q function under p hat, um, how close is it going to be to the true optimal q function? So what's the difference between q star and q hat star? And ideally, we'd like to see that that's low, low, bounded by some epsilon. So q hat star is the optimal q function we learn under our, our learned model, which is basically what happens if we do RL with this method. And as I mentioned before, we could also ask, 
how good is the resulting policy, which is not the same. So if we take the policy pi hat, which corresponds to q hat star, and we take the true q function of pi hat, how different is that from q star, meaning how suboptimal is the policy we get by running uh, q value iteration under p hat. And that, that last question is really the one that quantifies the performance of RL because that's really telling us how much worse is the policy would get under the model p hat than the best policy we could have gotten anywhere. Okay. Now it turns out that actually the first question, the policy evaluation question, gives us a tool that is very good for answering the other two questions. So we'll mostly focus on the first question, how close is q hat pi to q pi for a given policy pi, and then we'll see how to utilize that as a tool to answer the other two questions. So before I get into this, uh, let's introduce some standard tools in supervised learning theory. So all of this analysis has to do with how the number of samples affects the error in estimating some quantity. In supervised learning, we have inequalities that allow us to bound the error for estimating some quantity using some number of samples, and these are referred to as concentration inequalities because they quantify how quickly our estimate of some random variable concentrates around the true uh, expect the value of that variable. So whenever we need to answer questions about how close a learned function is to the true function in terms of the number of samples, we use concentration inequalities. One of the most basic concentration inequalities, and typically the first one that you would learn about if you take a, a machine learning theory class, is Hofting's inequality. So the full statement of Hofting's inequality is given here. Um, but it's, it's a little bit opaque, but it has a very simple interpretation. So let me describe the full statement, and then I'll provide a little bit of intuition for what it's really saying. So suppose that x1, x2 through xn are a sequence of independent, identically distributed random variables with mean and mu. What are x1 through xn? Well, these are your samples. So you have some true distribution, and that true distribution has a mean mu. Now, we don't really know anything else about that distribution. We'll just say it has a mean mu. And you take some samples from that distribution. Let x bar n be the sample-wise average. So x bar n is the uh, sum over all the xi's divided by n. So it's the average value. Now this is your estimate of the average, right? The true average may not match this. If you only generated like two samples, averaging them together doesn't give you their true average. You might incur some error because you have too few samples. So what Hofting's inequality does is it quantifies how much error you would get as a function of n. So suppose that uh, each of these samples is in the range from b, b minus to b plus. Right, so this is just saying that uh, whatever their mean and whatever their distribution is, they can never be less than b minus and they can never be larger than b plus. And then we have uh, the following two results. Your sample-based estimate of the average, x bar n, is greater than or equal to the true average plus epsilon with probability that is, at, that is at most e to the negative 2 n epsilon squared divided by b plus minus b minus squared. So what this means is that the probability that your sample-based estimate of the mean differs from the true mean in the positive direction by epsilon is no greater than e to the negative 2 n epsilon squared over b plus plus b minus squared. And this is actually very good. This means that your probability of making a mistake larger than epsilon decreases exponentially in the number of samples. And similarly, you have a bound on the other side. The probability of your estimate being less than mu minus epsilon is also less than or equal to epsilon to the negative 2n epsilon squared divided by b, b plus plus b minus squared. So this describes how quickly your estimate x bar n concentrates around the true mean mu, because as epsilon goes to zero, uh, then your estimate approaches mu, and here we see the probability that your epsilon will deviate, that your um, estimate will deviate from mu by more than epsilon. Now this has a few uh, implications, right? So if we estimate mu with n samples, the probability that we're off by more than epsilon is at most the thing on the right-hand side of this inequality, and we can equivalently reinterpret it to say that if you want this probability to be delta, so if you want the probability uh, to be off by more than epsilon to be at most delta, meaning that you are you have a 
an error less than epsilon with probability at least one minus delta, then you can simply solve for delta. So you can say, I want delta to be less than or equal to two times e to the negative two n epsilon squared over b plus plus b minus squared. The reason the two is there is because you can be off either in the positive direction or in the negative direction. Uh, and then you could just solve for delta. So you can take the log of both sides um, and then you can uh, do a little bit of algebra, rearrange these things. So uh, here in the first step, what I did is I divided both sides by two and took the log. Then in the next step, uh, what I did is I uh, divided both sides by b plus minus b minus squared over 2n and uh, negated both sides. So that uh, changes the less than or equal to into greater than or equal to. And then you take the square root and you see that you need b plus minus b minus over square root of 2n times the square root of log 2 over delta to be greater than or equal to epsilon. So if you want some error epsilon with probability uh, delta, or you want your error to be less than epsilon with probability 1 minus delta, then the number of samples you need scales as the square root of n. Um, or you can also write down a function for n in terms of epsilon and delta, same thing. Just do a bunch of algebraic manipulation uh, to get n on one side, um, and you can see that uh, you know, if, if you have this number of samples, then you will have error at most epsilon uh, with probability no larger than delta. So one of the conclusions that you can get from this is that error scales with one over square root of n. That's pretty convenient. So hopefully this gives you some idea of how these concentration inequalities work. You write down some equation for, for the probability that you'll be off by um, epsilon, and then you can s manipulate that equation to solve for the probability delta or to solve for the number of samples. Now, in a lot of the analysis that we do in reinforcement learning, we're concerned with estimating probabilities of categorical variables. So P of S prime given SA is a distribution over a categorical variable, not a real valued variable. So Hofting's inequality applies to estimating the mean of a continuous valued random variable. Uh, but here, if we're estimating P hat, we're actually concerned with our accuracy in estimating the probability distribution over a categorical variable, in this case S prime. Um, so a similar kind of concentration inequality can be derived for that. Uh, let's say that uh, z is some kind of discrete random variable that takes values in 1 through d. So d is the cardinality of z, d is the number of possible values. And they're distributed according to q. So q is a vector of probabilities that uh, are all greater than 0 and sums to 1. And there are d values in q. So if you write it as a vector where the jth entry is the probability that z takes on its jth value, and you assume that you have n iid samples, uh, and that the empirical estimate is given by basically counting the number of times you get each value, so exactly the way that we're estimating p hat up above, then you have a concentration inequality that looks kind of similar to Hofting's inequality, um, but for estimating the probabilities of these uh, uh, random variables. So it's really the second one uh, that we care about. So the first one is a probability that your error in the two norm is going to be bounded. The second one has to do with the error in the one norm. And the error in the one norm, that's total variation divergence. That's the one we're going to be using. So if you look at the last line of this uh, theorem, the probability that your estimate of the probabilities, that, that q hat, minus the true probabilities, q, in the one norm, which is total variation divergence, the probability that their total variation divergence is greater than or equal to the square root of d times 1 over root n plus epsilon is less than or equal to e to the negative n times epsilon squared. Okay, uh, And notice the similarity to Hofting's inequality. So in Hofting's inequality, we also had the probability be bounded by e to the negative 2n times, some times epsilon squared with some other coefficients. So here we have a negative n epsilon squared. It's just that the constants are different. And the thing that we are greater than or equal to um, is uh, not epsilon, it's now this root d1 over root n plus epsilon thing. But we can do all the same stuff. We can take this uh, quantity and we can solve it for delta, for example. Uh, and we know that uh, delta is less than or equal to e to the negative n epsilon squared. Uh, we can solve it for epsilon uh, and we get epsilon is less than or equal to one over root n times the square root of log one over delta. Uh, 
uh, and we can solve it for n, and we get that n is less than or equal to 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta. So all the same stuff, we can describe uh, what the error will be as a function of the number of samples, or how many samples we need as a function of the error and the probability. So if we just make a substitution, substitute the symbols for p hat, the cardinality of s prime is uh, s, or capital S, the, well, the cardinality of capital S, that's the number of states. So if we just plug this directly into this inequality, uh, we know that if we use n samples for every state action tuple, then the total variation divergence, the one norm between p hat s prime given s a and the true p of s prime given s a is less than or equal to the square root of the number of states times one over the square root of n plus epsilon with probability uh, one minus delta. Uh, now, this is, this is when we, in the case where we have n samples for each s a. So the total number of samples that we'll be using to estimate this model is n times the number of states times the number of actions. So just important to keep in mind some of the constants here. And uh, if, if I do uh, a little bit of uh, symbolic manipulation on this, just basically distribute the square root of s into the, into the parentheses, I get this. And roughly I can say that this is bounded by some constant times the square root of the number of states times log one over delta divided by n. Right? So uh, you know, the, it's, it actually it's one plus uh, um, the square root of log one over delta, but as long as we don't care about the constants, uh, and as long as we don't care about delta, it's, we can write it as some c, and that'll make it a little bit convenient, so then we have fewer terms flying around. Okay, so now that we've got our concentration inequalities out of the way, and we can understand how accurate our learned model is going to be, as a function of the number of samples. Let's re relate the error in p hat to the error in q hat pi. And this is where we actually get into the RL-centric part of the analysis. So, so far, all of our discussion dealt with just general machine learning theory. Now we're gonna get into the parts that are really specific to reinforcement learning. So let's try to relate the model p to q pi. For now, we won't worry about approximations or anything. I just want to write down some equations that relate p to q pi for a fixed pi. Uh, and we saw this actually before when we talked about offline RL, but I'll just repeat it here for convenience. Um, so this is the Bellman equation. So q pi at some state, s, an action sa, is equal to the reward rsa plus gamma times the expected value uh, over s prime distributed according to p of s prime given sa of v pi s prime. And v pi s prime, of course, is the expected value of q pi uh, s prime a prime under pi. And we can expand out the expectation, just write it as a sum. Writing it as a sum will make it easier to turn this into a linear algebra equation that we can then manipulate symbolically. So if we write this in vector notation, if we say that q is a vector with s a entries, r is a vector with s a entries, and p is a matrix, we can write q pi is equal to r plus gamma p v pi. So if we have, let's say, two states and two actions, q pi is a big vector with s a entries. So it has two times two, four entries if you have two states and two actions. r is also a big vector uh, with four entries, two by two. And it doesn't actually matter how you arrange these entries, so you could imagine that it's like s1 a1, s1 a2, s2 a1, s2 a2, or you could imagine that it's the other way around. It doesn't really matter. It's just something that is of length s a. p is a matrix that describes how a state action tuple transitions into a state. So P has SA rows, so for the stuff on the right-hand side of the conditioning bar, and it has S columns, because it gives you the probability of each state given some state in action. So the number of columns is the number of states, the number of rows is the number of possible state action tuples. And V is a vector with the number of entries equal to the number of states. And you can see that all the dimensionalities line up. So you can multiply p by v pi, and that gives you a vector with s a entries, and then you can add that to r, and that'll be the same dimensionality as q pi. We can also write v as some matrix capital pi times q pi. Remember that v is an expected value with respect to the actions of the q function. So pi here is a matrix that now has uh, s different rows and s a columns and every entry is the probability of some action in some state. 
so uh, that means that q pi is equal to r plus gamma times some matrix p pi times q pi, where p pi is just what you get uh, by multiplying uh, capital P by capital pi. Um, all right, so now with that out of the way, we have uh, q pi is equal to r plus gamma p pi q pi. Okay, so p pi is just some kind of a uh, matrix. And what we can do is we can take this gamma p pi q pi and throw it on the left-hand side of the equality. So we can say that q pi minus gamma p pi q pi is equal to r. And now we can see that you, you have all the terms involving q pi collected on the left-hand side. So you can uh, distribute out the matrix multiplying them and you get i minus uh, gamma p pi times q pi is equal to r. It turns out, although it is not trivial to prove this, that i minus gamma p pi is actually always going to be invertible. So you can write q pi as being equal to i minus gamma p pi inverse times r. And now we've related p to q pi. So we can write q pi as a function of p, uh, and well, specifically as a function of p pi. It's a nonlinear function, but we have this uh, relationship and then we can use it to describe how errors in p will affect errors in q. Okay. Um, now, this is true for any uh, dynamics. So just like we can write q pi is equal to i minus gamma p pi inverse r, we can also write q hat pi is equal to i minus gamma p hat pi inverse times r. Because remember, q hat pi was obtained uh, just by solving the learned MDP uh, determined by p hat. So now we're gonna introduce a little lemma that we're going to use to understand the relationship between errors in p hat and errors in q hat. We'll actually introduce two lemmas and then we'll put them together and get our conclusion. So the first lemma is what's called the simulation lemma. The simulation lemma describes how a q function in the true MDP, q pi, differs from the q function in the learned MDP, q hat pi. This is the statement of the simulation lemma. It might be a little opaque, but I'll unpack this shortly. So the simulation lemma says that q pi minus q hat pi is equal to gamma times i minus gamma p hat pi inverse times p minus p hat times v pi. So this part is the difference in probabilities. This is basically the difference between the true model and the learned model. This is the true value. So you can think of these as differences in probabilities weighted by their value. The value kind of, you know, roughly speaking, uh, constitutes their relative importance. And this is this evaluation operator. This is the thing that takes reward functions to Q functions. So roughly speaking, what we're doing is uh, we're taking our true value function, we're converting into a kind of a pseudo reward by passing it through the difference of the dynamics, and then we are basically running Q iteration on the pseudo reward. Okay, and slightly op opaque result, but it'll be uh, pretty useful later. So first I'll prove the simulation lemma, and that'll give you kind of a taste for some of the tools we use in these algebraic manipulations. Then I'll prove one more lemma, and then I'll put them together to actually quantify the error in q hat pi. So the way we do this is actually fairly mechanical. We have q pi minus q hat pi, and we're gonna replace q hat pi with uh, the equation up above. Why? Well, notice how the right-hand side of the simulation lemma doesn't contain q hat pi. It contains v pi, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get v pi out of q pi, of course. Uh, and it also contains p hat. So we need to somehow get p hat in there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take q hat pi and we will, we'll replace it by this equation, i minus gamma p hat pi inverse r, because that contains p hat and it lets us get rid of q hat pi. And for q pi, what we're going to do is we're gonna stick in a uh, p hat in there too, because remember, we need to get a p hat in front of everything. So we'll just stick in i minus gamma p hat pi inverse times i minus gamma p hat pi, right? Because that's a matrix, a matrix inverse times itself, which is identity, so we can always put that in. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We have an i minus gamma p hat pi inverse in front of both terms, uh, and we have a q pi in there, so hopefully that'll go somewhere. Uh, so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take that r at the end, and I'll replace the r with i minus gamma p pi times q pi. 
right? Because q pi is equal to i minus gamma p pi inverse r. So I can multiply both sides by i minus gamma p pi, and that'll turn the, that r into an i minus gamma p pi q pi. So now I'm really getting somewhere. I've got two terms. They both have an i minus gamma p hat pi inverse in front of them, just like the simulation lemma. One of the terms has a p hat, and the other one has a p. So uh, when I group them together, I can basically, since they both have an i minus gamma p hat pi inverse in front of them, I get a i minus gamma p hat pi inverse. Then in parentheses, I have i minus gamma p hat pi minus i minus gamma p pi, and the whole thing is multiplied by q pi. So the identities cancel out, and uh, since that second one becomes a minus minus gamma p pi, I can switch the order, and I get uh, p pi minus p hat pi. That, whole, that is all multiplied by gamma, so I take the gamma out front, and that leaves me with gamma i minus gamma p hat pi inverse times p pi minus p hat pi times q pi. Now remember that q pi, that, that p pi is just p times this matrix pi. And it's the same matrix pi for both p and p hat. So that gives me this equation. Uh, and v pi is just capital pi times q pi. So I can take the capital pi out, replace that with v pi, and then I, I finish proving the lemma. Okay, so that's kind of the, the nature of the algebraic manipulation. It's not terribly insightful, but it gives us this useful lemma. Now here's another useful lemma. This one is going to be even simpler. Given p pi and any vector uh, in RSA, we're going to have this relationship. If we apply i minus gamma p pi inverse, meaning this uh, uh, evaluation operator, to the vector v, the infinity norm of that is less than or equal to the infinity norm of v divided by 1 minus gamma, meaning that applying i minus gamma p pi inverse to some vector will blow up the infinity norm of that vector by at most a factor of 1 over 1 minus gamma. So intuitively, the q function corresponding to a reward v is at most 1 over 1 minus gamma times larger in terms of the infinity norm. By the way, we see a lot of these 1 over 1 minus gamma terms flying around. Just to make it clear where these come from, uh, usually when you have sums of discounted rewards, uh, you're going to have sums that look like this. You're going to have a sum from t equals 0 to infinity of gamma to the t times some number c. I mean, usually the c will depend on t, but typically it'll be bounded by some quantity, like it'll be bounded by the largest reward. So you'll often end up with bounds that have terms that look like a sum over from t equals 0 to infinity of gamma to the t times c. And that's a c times a, a geometric series, and that's equal to c over 1 minus gamma. Right? So when you have a geometric series like that, it ends up equaling 1 over 1 minus gamma. That's just kind of a standard math result. And that's where all these 1, minus, 1 over 1 minus gamma terms come from. One way to interpret it is that this is a kind of horizon term. So if we had a finite horizon problem and gamma was 1, then the multiplier in front of c would just be the value of the horizon. So usually we think of 1 over 1 minus gamma as kind of the effective horizon of an infinite horizon problem, how, how far out you go uh, before you basically stop seeing the effect of those rewards. So that's why we end up with a lot of 1 over 1 minus gamma terms flying around. And whenever you see a 1 over 1 minus gamma term, think horizon. Okay. So let, let's go through the proof of this lemma. Uh, we're going to use w as shorthand for i minus gamma p pi inverse v, just so that our equations are short. And uh, that means that the infinity norm of v is going to be equal to the infinity norm of i minus gamma p pi inverse times w. Um, Uh, sorry, that there's a there's a little uh, typo here. That should actually be um, i minus gamma p pi times w without the inverse. So uh, the this inverse here, this is a, a little mistake. So this is greater than or equal to uh, by the triangle inequality, uh, the infinity norm of i times w minus uh, gamma times the infinity norm of p pi times w. That's just from the triangle inequality. So whenever you have uh, the the norm of the difference of two vectors that is greater than or equal to the difference of the norms of the two vectors. And now um, what we can do is we can take that second term, p pi times w, 
and we actually know that the infinity norm of p pi times w is greater uh, is uh, is going to be less than or equal to the infinity norm of w. Why? Well, because um, p pi is a stochastic matrix. So uh, when you take a linear combination of some vector with weights that are uh, greater than or equal to zero and some to less than or equal to one, um, then uh, you can't increase the length of that vector. So that's why uh, you can take out the p pi term there. So now you have the infinity norm of w minus gamma times the infinity norm of w. So that's one minus gamma times the infinity norm of w. Now this is a bound, of course. It's not necessarily equal to that. It's just uh, greater than or equal to that. Um, so if you divide everything through by one minus gamma, then you get the infinity norm of uh, v divided by one minus gamma is greater than or equal to the infinity norm of w. And remember, w is uh, i minus gamma p pi inverse times v, and that completes the proof. So now uh, putting these pieces together, we've got our two lemmas, i minus gamma p pi inverse v in the infinity norm is less than or equal to v in the infinity norm over one minus gamma. And we've got the simulation lemma. So now what we'll do is we'll plug in p minus p hat v pi from the simulation lemma into this uh, second lemma in place of v. And that will tell us that uh, the infinity norm of q pi minus q hat pi, that the infinity norm of the left-hand side of the uh, simulation lemma is, of course, equal to the infinity norm of the right-hand side, because if the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, then their infinity norms are equal. But then if we apply this, um, uh, this top-left equation using p minus p hat v pi as little v, then this is less than or equal to gamma, that comes from the fact the whole thing is multiplied by gamma, over 1 minus gamma, that comes from the top-left equation, times p minus p hat times v pi in the infinity norm. Okay, so now we've related q pi to q hat pi to the difference between p and p hat, uh, but that difference is weighted by this v pi thing. So what we can do is we can say, well, uh, if you have some, uh, some kind of matrix times um, a vector, you know, their product is, is going to be less than or equal to the product of the largest entries. So you could say that this is less than or equal to gamma over 1 minus gamma, of the max over SA, so that that's taking taking a max over the um, the rows of the matrix um, of the one norm between uh, the difference between the, uh, the the entries times the largest possible entry in V pi. This is a fairly crude bound, right? This is going to be pretty loose, uh, but it is a bound. Uh, and now we've turned this into a form that uh, uses quantities that we can actually get from our concentration inequalities from before. So if you remember, our concentration inequality was basically analyzing the max uh, over SA of the one norm, the total variation divergence, between P and P hat. Um, can we bound V pi, uh, the infinity norm of V pi? Well, basically, yes, because V pi is the sum of over rewards. And if you have a sum from t equals 0 to infinity of gamma to the t times some reward RT, well, let's just replace all the rewards of the largest possible reward. Let's call that R max. Uh, and then we can use the same geometric uh, series formula and get a, one, a bound of 1 over 1 minus gamma times R max. So values are always bounded by 1 over 1 minus gamma times R max. And we'll assume that, uh, that R max is 1. It's actually fairly standard in this kind of analysis. Just assume that your rewards are between 0 and 1. The reason that we do that is because, uh, well, rewards are invariant to additive and multiplicative factors. So you can assume some range on your reward pretty much without loss of generalization as long as your rewards are always finite. Um, so that allows us to get rid of this v pi infinity term, and then we're left with this equation, that q pi minus q hat pi is less than or equal to gamma over 1 minus gamma squared times uh, the total variation divergence on p maximized over SA. So now we can use that, that concentration equality from before, uh, which allows us to relate that total variation divergence. Um, the constant is actually going to be different. It's going to be C2 instead of just C. The reason the constant changes is because we're taking a max over all the states in action, so that requires us to apply a union bound. Uh, remember that um, these are all things that are happening with probability 1 minus delta. So if you have SA different events, each with probability 1 minus delta, uh, then if you want to bound the max, you need to use the union bound.
but that doesn't actually change any of the values we care about. It mostly just changes the constants. So this is the final result that we're left with. And now remember what I said at the very beginning. The purpose of doing all this analysis is not to prove that anything will work super well, but it's to understand how error will be affected by various parameters of the problem. So we can see that you know some parts of the analysis are quite appealing. Uh, for example, more samples leads to lower error. And in particular, uh, the values concentrate at a rate of uh, 1 over square root of n, which is actually the same as in supervised learning. So the effect of samples uh, is the same. But what is interesting is that the error grows quadratically in 1 over 1 minus gamma. So the gamma term in the numerator we don't really care about because that's going to be close to 1, but the denominator we care about a great deal. And the important thing about this bound is that the denominator is squared. So you can think of it as error growing quadratically in the horizon. We've seen error growing quadratically in horizons before, so that's not actually a new thing to us. So basically what this tells us is that each backup uh, over our time horizon accumulates error. And in fact, it accumulates it quadratically. Now there are some uh, algorithms and some fitting strategies for which the error is not quadratic. So it's not always quadratic. Uh, but it is for this naive scheme that we analyzed. All right. Um, so that hopefully gives you a flavor of how this analysis works. Now, a few relatively simple implications of this analysis. We showed that q pi minus q hat pi is less than or equal to epsilon. And epsilon is given by this equation. Uh, what about the difference between q star and q hat star? Now, this is a little different, right? Because in q pi minus q hat pi, both q functions are for the same policy, but evaluated using different models. Now we're asking, what is the difference between the optimal q function under p versus the optimal q function under p hat. And those will correspond to different policies. So there's a really uh, useful uh, little uh, identity that we're going to use. If you have two functions, f and g, and you want to take the absolute value, or in general, any kind of norm, of the difference between their supremums, between the largest values they take on, that's going to be less than or equal to the supremum of the difference. It kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're maximizing f and g separately, um, that difference is going to be uh, only smaller than if you're just directly maximizing their difference. Now, the thing about optimal q functions is that they are, of course, the supremum of q pi over all the policies, right? That's what an optimal q function is. It's the q function of the policy that has the largest q values. So you can replace q star with a supremum over pi of q pi, and you can replace q hat star with a supreme over pi of q hat pi. And then we apply this convenient identity, and we see that this is less than or equal to the supremum over pi of the difference of the q functions. But we know uh, from our main result that q pi minus q hat pi is less than or equal to epsilon for all policies pi, which means that this whole thing is also less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so that's pretty convenient. We just directly took our result and we used it to relate the optimal q functions. Now, but this doesn't actually tell us what the performance of the policy that we find under p, p hat will be in the true MDP. So that's the other question. What is the difference between q star and the true q function corresponding to pi hat star, corresponding to the policy that we get by doing the argmax action under q hat star. Um, here it's a, uh, the analysis is a little bit more involved. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this difference and we're going to subtract and add q hat pi hat star. So we can always insert you know minus x plus x because that's equal to zero. So we're going to put in q star minus q hat pi hat star plus q hat pi hat star minus uh, q pi hat star. And then we'll break these up using the triangle inequality. So this is less than or equal to q star minus q hat pi hat star plus q pi hat uh, uh, star minus q hat pi hat star. So the second term in this uh, basically is the difference between the true q function and the learned q function for the same policy. Um, so we know that that is bounded by epsilon. Uh, the, the first term q hat pi hat star is just q hat star, right? That's the, that is the q function corresponding to the best policy under our learned model. Um, and then in the second term, they're the same policy. So that means that we can use the top left result for the second term, and we can use the q star minus q hat star result for the first term. 
and both of them are bounded by epsilon, so that means that the whole thing is bounded by two times epsilon. Okay, so that's a pretty straightforward way to complete these results.